Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Brian Cantrell. I'm here with my colleague Dave Pacheco um, Hi. From, from Joint. So uh, we're going to talk in particular about deploying systems into production. Um, and I know that, that sometimes people run for their lives when they hear the word production. Um, so we're, we're going to try to ease in um, by bringing up, hopefully, what is a, a familiar figure to some of you, maybe? So this is John McCarthy. Um, and, and of course, he, and it's great to see, you know, hands go up and, and so many recognize one of the truly one of the, the programming language pioneers. Uh, John McCarthy passed away recently. Uh, and, but uh, John McCarthy in, invented Lisp, of course. Um, and Lisp is, I believe, feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but Lisp is the first uh, interpreted language. Um, it is the first dynamic language, or the first, the beginning of a dynamic language. Uh, and it's actually very interesting to read the history of Lisp. Uh, it was an interpreted language almost by accident. Um, I actually didn't realize this, but they were trying to design a compiled language. I mean, this is for the, you know, this is the IBM 704 back in the day. They were trying to design a compiled language, and it was only, the, the, it kind of fell out that it was actually just easier to implement things to make it interpreted. And then they made this incredible discovery um, that once the language was interpreted, you could actually move faster. The existence of an interpreter and the absence of declarations makes it particularly natural to use Lisp in a time-sharing environment. It is convenient to define functions, test them, and re-edit them without ever leaving the Lisp interpreter. Uh, and again, the Lisp, this, this was first in the, in the late 50s that Lisp was being developed. And the first Lisp interpreter is about 1960. So this is a very long time ago. And the thing that's kind of interesting to me about this is that from the very beginning, the dynamic languages, interpreted languages, were about programmer productivity. That's the reason we use these languages. The reason we don't write everything in C, or actually even assembly, all the time, is because it would take us longer. It would take us longer because certain aspects of it are harder, um, and there's certain things that are more tedious in these lower level languages. So these higher level dynamic interpreted languages, of which certainly JavaScript is one, are all about making us more productive as programmers. Now, for many years, I mean, so you have Lisp is, is an interpreted environment in 1960, but interpreted languages don't really enter the mainstream until the mid-1990s. Now, I, I know that you know, small talk is mother's milk and is sacred here, and I, so I want to I wanna respect that. Um, but the reality is we weren't all programming in small talk in the mid-90s, and I, I'm so sorry. I, it's not because small talk wasn't obviously superior to everything that was being done ever in the history of humanity, because I, I'm sure it probably was, um, or I'm sure it's wise to say that now anyway. Um, but it, we weren't. Dynamic languages hadn't gone mainstream. And that's for a lot of reasons, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tread very lightly and sensitively, but I'm going to say that part of this was the fact that CPUs were, were actually underpowered relative to what these environments were trying to do. DRAM was undersized relative to what these environments were trying to do. And yes, you could, and there are terrific papers on Smalltalk 80 being implemented on very limited resource machines. But the reality was that wasn't the mainstream of dynamic languages um, in the mid-90s. And then, but things were improving. And things were getting better and faster. And the world was ready for a kind of a breakout dynamic language. Um, and we saw that in Java, for better or for ill. Um, when Java was introduced in 1995, it, it so quickly became one of the world's most popular languages that I, I, can't, I think you can't help but argue that the world was ready for it. The world was ready to be at a higher layer of abstraction. And Java was terrific because, it, it, especially when, when the, um, in you know, five or six or seven years later, when other languages began to flower on top of the JVM, that we now are in an environment which is terrific, which is that dynamic languages are everywhere. Um, and they're being used for real production software, uh, which is great because it makes us so much more productive. We can go do these things and build things so much more quickly today than we could even 10 years ago because of these languages. Um, so this is very important. But there's also a darker side. There's a darker side to these dynamic environments. Yes, it is very fast to build things. Um, and to, this, to introduce this darker side, we're going to go to another pioneer. Does anyone know who this is? So McCarthy is your tribe. This guy is mine. So does anyone know who this is? So this actually, he won his Turing before McCarthy won his. Um, this is Morris Wilkes. 
Uh, Morris Wilkes is, um, it, uh, is one of the very earliest computer pioneers. Um, he and his team at, at Cambridge developed the EDSAC, um, which was the first real stored program computer. It, yes, ENIAC was a machine, but EDSAC was really the first true embodiment of von Neumann's vision. A very important machine. And Wilkes is a, a tremendous pioneer uh, in many regards. But this quote from Wilkes, um, when I first read it, as but a lad, I, I felt that Wilkes was speaking to me across the decades. That as soon as we started programming, we found to our surprise that it wasn't as easy to get programs right as we had thought. Debugging had to be discovered. I can remember the exact instant when I realized that a large part of my life from then on was going to be spent in finding mistakes in my own programs. That is as true today as it was on the very first stored program computer. It's actually, I would make one small adjustment to that, which is I remember the exact instant when I realized that a large part of my life from then on was going to be finding the mistakes of others. Um, we don't just find our own mistakes. We find the mistakes of others as well. And I think that I, I'm, I'm sure there's like a, car there must be a caramel balance to the world. I mean, I think that don't all of us feel as if we're often finding the bugs in other people's code? But in order for all of that to be true, there have to be people who are introducing many more bugs than they themselves are debugging. It's true. I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, who, I, where I is no that guy? I have no explanation. Is it like one dude? I mean, <laughs> it's one guy. If we could one, only find him. Man. Let's, let's go find that guy. He's, he is a problem. He's a problem. But so the, um, I mean, the reality is we're probably all wrong. It probably, it's, it's all, it's, you know, like you, everyone thinks their own flat you on smells fine, right? It's that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> it's like you, 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 you forget about your own bugs. We're all spending time in each other's codes, right? So, so, you know, we have 10 people on a team where we're spending a lot of our time in other people's code anyway. So I guess that kind of makes sense from that perspective. It, it kind of makes sense. Um, so the, the, these dynamic languages um, have a, a, a very serious debugging problem. Um, they, I mean, they are, they're terrific. They're terrific for, for programmer productivity. But actually trying to debug these things when they head south can be really, really ugly. Um, now, the, the reality is that, that in order to debug your, so you've got a program. It's running in the VM. And the program has moved sideways. It's doing something you don't want it to do. In order to be able to reason about what that program is doing, you need, there's a great deal of VM specificity that you have to have. And so in order to be able to debug these things, we have historically had the, these integrated development environments. And they allow us to do very powerful things. I mean, to be fair, the IDEs have come a long way in the last 10 to 15 years. And the developer in development is able to actually debug and understand their own software. And that's terrific. The problem is that has been the exclusive focus of debugging dynamic languages. That when, the, when that software shifts from not running in development but to running in production, the debugging tools that we have are not just anemic, but historically non-existent for these dynamic environments. And you have this, this black box, the VM, in which you cannot reason about what is running inside. Yes, it's executing instructions on the microprocessor, but those instructions are, are at such, they're so far down from the actual high-level code that's been generated that it is excruciating to actually get to that high-level code. And so what are the constraints of, of developing in a production environment? What is a production environment? What do we mean by this? So a production environment is code that people are depending on. right? And in those, those, th that environment, you can't simply modify the application to add debugging statements. You can't, often you can't even restart the application. Um, th th this code is actually actively being used all the time. Um, and it's very difficult to, add, to actually go deploy modified versions to get more debugging information. You can't assume that the failures are going to be reproducible. Uh, it, those of you who are software developers versus uh, well, um, with a focus on the ops side, um, you know that when you've got a bug in production, the first thing you want to do is go reproduce it in development. The problem is that our production systems are so complicated now that we have many, many bugs that you simply cannot reproduce in development. And even if you reproduce the bug in development, how do you know you've reproduced the right bug and not just the symptoms of the bug? So you can't, you can't assume that you're going to be able to re reproduce these things at all, let alone in development. And the failure modes themselves may not even, sometimes they're explosive, and you can get a stack trace and try to reason about it, but oftentimes they're not. They're transient. Or the app just goes into the black hole of misery. 
right? I, for whatever reason, Erlang seems to do that more than, I mean, I don't want to pick on Erlang, but uh, Erlang seems to love the black hole of misery, um, it, it, or at least for us anyway. But you, these environments go in and they just, they're off doing something. Rabbit is consuming all of 16 cores at 100%. It's like, Rabbit, you are executing 32 billion instructions per second. That's a lot of compute. What the hell are you doing? Please tell me what you're doing. We've got no idea. So the, we need to, the, these are the constraints. And the problem is that we've got to be able to walk up to this thing that has failed transiently, the, the failures are non-reproducible, and we need to be able to understand it. So, I mean, I don't know, these constraints just seem impossible. I mean, how do you possibly debug anything? Dave, how do we possibly debug anything in production? Good question, Brian. So <laughs> for this, we turn again, once again, to history. And this is a quote from um, a paper from 1951, essentially the, you know, the dawn of computing as we know it. This is Stanley Gill from a paper, which is an excellent paper called The Diagnosis of Mistakes in Programs on the EDSAC. I'd strongly recommend reading this if you're at all interested in this stuff. You know, it doesn't require a lot of background on the machine or anything, but it's, it's a terrific paper. But he makes this observation in a way that sounds very euphemistic. He says, experience with the EDSAC has shown that although a high proportion of mistakes can be removed by preliminary checking, there frequently remain mistakes which could only have been detected in the early stages by prolonged and laborious study. I mean, that, that's obviously a euphemism, right? This is like, we, there's no way we could have actually figured these things out unless we spent like years studying the code looking for everything that could possibly go wrong. And he says, some attention, therefore, has been given to the problem of dealing with mistakes after the program has been tried and found to fail. And, and then he goes on to describe something he calls the postmortem technique, which is a way of uh, essentially figuring out after the program has failed what the state of the machine was and understanding the pro the the problem from that. So um, we've had this for a long time, obviously, since 1951 at least. And it, on modern systems, you can do this with native programs, right? Programs you write in C, you can get a core dump. And with a core dump, you can look at global variable state, you can look at all of the threads that are around, you can um, you presumably, ha in a lot of cases, you have a little bit of extra information about the objects, structures, offsets that allow you to examine in extreme detail, every piece of the program state. How many people have looked at a core dump? Okay, oh, excellent. Man, we're awesome. in the right room. Awesome. We are in the right room. That's great. I knew we were in the right room. This is great. Sweet. So, and there's, there's two important properties about this too, which is that when a program fails fatally and dumps core, it, yeah, a native program, a C program, say, um, the system immediately, I mean, the process exits, right? So, so if you're using some kind of restarter, the system immediately restarts the service and restores service, right? And importantly, you can take the artifact of that, which is the core dump, and copy it off to some other system where you've got very sophisticated tooling to figure out what's happened. So you're, you, know, you don't have to wait for an engineer to get on that system and you know, enter a debugger and sort of poke around. Meanwhile, production requests are not being serviced because this program is halted or the state is changing from underneath it so the programmer is getting confused. This is an extremely important property, right? This is the crux of what we're getting at. And it's not unique to us, right? I mean, this is called forensic engineering in other domains. Um, other domains have forensic engineering, and indeed, forensic engineering and the ability to do forensic engineering is what allows us to deliver life critical, safety critical systems. Uh, you look at like aviation, right? There are f only four unsolved plane crashes in the United States. Um, all four of those predate the flight data recorder and co cockpit voice recorder. Literally every other major aviation accident, uh, and this is now since the 60s, has been root caused. And that root ca often, you know, there are many root causes. These are cascading failures, and we use it to fix the system. As a result, can you think of the top of your head the last time a major airliner went down in the United States? The airliners no longer crash. It's actually pretty amazing um, that we, we just, we, because these systems are so mature, but we, it's because we've been able to do forensic engineering. So forensic engineering is critical to all engineering domains, not just software. Yeah, so. Uh, okay. yeah, and I guess the, you know, the question from our perspective is, is can we actually do this with dynamic environments? And from right. our, you know, Dave and I are, we're OS kernel guys. This is how we develop the kernel. Um, when, when the kernel crashes, we always get a complete snapshot of state, um, and kernels crash so infrequently that you only have one shot to debug many problems, and that, that is that, that crash stuff. You can't have it crash again. So can we do it with dynamic environments? That's the question. Now, historically, this has been pretty difficult, right? If you just take the same tools that you would apply to a native program, you know, you apply GDB, you apply PStack, 
you don't really get anything that useful, right? You don't, um, and there are a lot of reasons for this. One is that the, um, if you look at the things that are in a core dump, you've got the symbols, you've got mapped memory. So right there, you've got all the, the native functions, and you can disassemble them and see what's going on. Um, you know, again, you've got some metadata describing the offsets, the structures, and stuff, so you can print those things out. But you don't have any of that for the dynamic environment. If your Python program dumped core or your Java program dumped core, you don't have anything that resembles a Java class or a Java method or uh, you know, a Python object. In order to actually build these abstractions, you'd have to do a bunch of work on top of that to, to essentially model, uh, to basically resynthesize all those abstractions from the information that's in the core file. There are also some things that you want to include that don't even exist in the language itself. So in JavaScript, you've got the event queue, this, this list of events that, is going to, that are going to be executed as soon as um, the current event is finished being processed. That doesn't even exist in the language. There's no way to introspect that and see what's on that queue, let alone. Uh, so if you want to present this to, to a user, you have to sort of figure out how to even present it. And then uh, you have to dig that information out of the core file. Um, and the other really important thing about this, the, the, the real crux of the constraint is they, these tools cannot assume that the VM is currently running. That's the whole point. The program has already crashed. Maybe the VM has crashed, but even if it hasn't, um, you want to be able to do these things after the fact on a different system. You want to be able to do sophisticated post-mortem analysis techniques, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but things that might involve brute force. They might take a really long time. Um, so the VM is, you cannot assume that the VM is still running when you do this. You're operating on a snapshot of memory. Um, so we took a particular, we took a stab at this for Node.js. Um, you know, we had a particular interest in Node.js. Um, but this is actually not, you know, we, we've looked at other dynamic environments, and this problem is not really solved in any of the ones that we looked at, any of the major ones. Yeah, so we're, we're going to wade somewhat deeply in the Node here. How many people have used Node, have heard of Node? Okay, good, good. How good. many people have deployed it in production? Okay, cool. That's good. I, and I noticed a lot of hands going up on have used Node and have debugged from Cordon. So this is, this is good. Yes. We're, we're, we're going to bring those the two right hands crowd. together. Um, and we're, we're, we're going to unify this as one. And I'll, the, the origin of this, in terms of our particular interest, is that we at Joyent had developed a new service. David developed a new service to allow us to understand the latency of our running uh, cloud infrastructure software. So we, we are an infrastructure as a service provider, uh, and we developed a facility to allow our customers to view the latency of their app. The background of that doesn't necessarily matter. What's important is that it's a Node.js app that we were getting ready to deploy into production. And was, I swear it was, like, it was like the day before we were going to deploy it was, production. It was the day before we were planning to go live. So we're literally just about to go live, and the thing is rocking, and it's working, and we're all excited, and excited and a little bit nervous, you know, a little bit nervous that everything is going to be a flaming disaster when we deploy into production. Um, but, you know, basically excited. And we're just doing some kind of like final demos to one another or whatever, and all of a sudden, one of our aggregator processes, it's written in Node, all of a sudden starts spinning out of control on CPU. Go, oh, what's this? And it doesn't seem to be coming. It's, it's in CPU. It's on CPU, in user land, in the black hole. And the symptom, by the way, is the user that's looking at the, the graphs, the real-time graphs of their, of their program, it just it stopped. The, the graphs stop. The user interface completely locks up effectively. Right. The, the system is totally unusable. So it's definitely, a, this is a particular problem. And obviously, these, this thing is scaled out. But if you are a user who happens to have been assigned to this aggregator, what you're seeing is no data coming out of you. So OK, um, let's go debug this. Um, so we've got uh, Dave uh, and me, and then Ryan Dahl, who was the inventor of Node, who's, who's at Joyent. Um, and so the three of us go to debug this problem. Now, Dave obviously wrote the software. Ryan wrote Node, um, and I, at Sun, along with two colleagues, invented a particular technology called DTrace that allows us to dynamically instrument the system in arbitrary ways. You got to think, between the three of us, we're going to get this thing nailed. And we were such, I mean, dumb chimps staring at the laptop, like scratching ourselves, trying, and, I mean, it reminded me of the bad old days of kernel debugging, when, before we had this tooling, and we had no idea what was going on, and, we're, and no ability to figure it out. And, and if we're looking at the, Dave, maybe it's worth pulling up like a stack trace from that problem, just so people have an idea of, of when I say no idea, I've actually got a, because we actually took a core dump, um, hoping that we would be able to come back to this. I think I've got here. So yeah, let me, let me when I sh say no idea, this is what a, we did a G core so we could take a core dump of the live thing. This is the actual stack trace. Um, that you see. So when I, because you may say, oh, well, they have no idea. 
but I'm good. I'd have an idea. Okay, smarty pants. All we need to do is find whoever wrote FC21A0C5. Because that guy's our problem. Actually, it's even more frustrating than that because we actually did know that that was our problem. We actually did know because we, yeah. after observing this for, for some period of time, it's like, actually, as it happens, FC21A0C5 is the problem. We had no way of determining if I could just know what function. Just tell me the file. Just tell, <laughs> actually, just tell me some letters present in its file name. <laughs> I that, mean, just that anything, been really please, useful. anything, anything. I'll be good, I'll be good, I promise. But we're looking at this and it's just like, this is actually hopeless. Um, and we, and we, we had, the, there is a node debugger, um, and right, yep. we, so, so Ryan had suggested um, trying to use the node debugger at the time, the pro so you could send sig user one on node, and it would open up a debug port and you could attach with the V8 debugger. The problem was, it only did that when you got back to the event loop. So we were stuck in the right. event loop. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny story about the event loop. We're not going so, there. That's the problem. Like, send you sig hey. user one. It's like, OK, I'll open up that debug port. Just finish up what you're doing. Right, as no. soon as you go back to the event loop, as soon as you're done doing whatever you're doing, we'll open up this debugger and we can figure out what you're doing. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to finish up what I'm doing because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, do you know what FC21A0C5 is? <laughs> uh, so it, this was frustrating. And th so we had that, that the, so we didn't debug it. We, did, we took a core but couldn't debug it. Uh, and then the question was, how quickly after we deploy into production are we going to see this everywhere? And the question I had was, will this be milliseconds or microseconds after we deploy into production? Right, you no figure, doubt you could, that this is going to be a meltdown flaming disaster when we go into production. Right, you've got this highly concurrent system, and we were able to trigger this bug by just like playing around with by it. By playing for around with it, right, hour. exactly. It means it, and, it, but Dave, as I recall, you, you were much more optimistic than I was. I think I might have been at first. I mean, I, I barely remember. I mean, maybe I figured we'd go like a week or something like that. But I think you talked me down to like certainly within the first day. So, well, I think I talked you down because we need to actually get a bet in place. I don't know if you guys do this in your in your workplace. You got to make people actually put money on their assertions. That's the, the, the conversations get much more focused. So Dave and I had to make an actual bet. Um, and yeah, within a day, that was easy money. So okay, yes. we deployed it into production. We're going to see this all over. Brace for impact. We don't see it anywhere. Doesn't happen. Days pass. Da Dave, at this point, is gloating. Weeks pass. At this point, Dave has like, forgotten to gloat. He's trying to remember to gloat every day, but just like, it just, the gloating has gotten old. Months pass. Literally six months later, now we've just forgotten about this thing. And of course, and this is the difference between amateur and professional, by the way. Amateur says, hey, great, we must have fixed the bug. Professional says, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. I know we didn't fix that bug. That is a bug, it's in our software, and it is lying in wait to fuck us at our most inopportune moment. On the very worst day of our lives. On the very worst That's day of our when lives, that bug is gonna this make bug appearance. is lying in wait, and it will pounce on us to make that day even worse. That is what will happen. And sure enough, exactly. I was in front of a customer, of course, demoing this, of course, and using it, all of a sudden, dunk, it locks up again. And you get that kind of fight or flight reaction. You know, you have a demo go south on you, um, which hopefully won't happen here. Um, but, it, and it, of course, very alarming. Um, I kind of made up something. Um, was hoping with this problem, but we look at this, exact same symptoms. But now we could actually go, we could actually go reason about it. We're going to show you a demo of that a little bit later on. But, um, so this is the problem. The problem is we look at this thing, and we've got absolutely no idea what is actually truly going on. So I, um, we just talk about Node.js just, just a little bit, um, because just to, many people have heard of it. One thing that you might find a little bit surprising is that a lot of our software at Joyent, our core software, is, is being written in Node. Um, stuff that was written in C. Stuff that we would have overwhelming biases to, run in, to, to write in C. Um, trust me, if there was any case to be made for writing these things in C, we would do it. Um, we love C. Um, not C++, not so much. C, yes. Um, but the, but for, for many of these things, uh, and, I mean, the, the, the services are actually simple enough and V8 is fast enough that it actually makes a lot more sense to write it in Node. Um, so, I mean, and, and Dave, I mean, you considered C for the service you're building, but it just, it just doesn't make sense. You talked me out of it. I did, I did talk. Hey, are you blaming me now? <laughs> no, it was, it was absolutely the right call. We were able to get a prototype up in, like, two weeks, and it was in production in, like, two months, I think. Um, and, you know, we expected that to take a lot longer. And it definitely would have taken a lot longer if we'd done that in C. And so we've done this with a bunch of services now. You know, we rattle off the list up there, um, and it, it's just kind of crazy. Just as an example, someone asked me, DHCP, really? You wrote a DHCP server in Node? 
It's like, well, yeah, actually. So what Joint does is we write this, we build this product called Smart Data Center, which runs the Joint public cloud. And so you've, you've got, you're essentially managing the servers that make up a data center. And one of the important pieces of that is uh, managing the platform images, the operating systems that each one is going to boot. So you can go in the web UI and you can say, I want this to boot this version of the kernel, and I'm, you know, I want to have this other server boot some other version. I want to make the new, this new version default on all new systems when they reboot. So you basically want, when these things boot, they net boot the platform image from uh, the head node of the data center. Well, the easiest way to do that is if you control DHCP. But the source of that information is this dynamic uh, source, which we have, which is the set of OS images and the configuration and stuff. It's like, why not just have a little node server that's speaking DHCP out one end and talks to our, our back end on the other side? And it actually, you know, it's a few hundred lines of code. It's really not a big deal. Well, also, it was not our first thought, by the way. Our first thought was, of course, I'm just going to take ISC DHCPD out back with a baseball bat, and I'm going to beat it within an inch of its life and get it to do this. Makes sense. Um, but it was amazing. And after basically a week and a half of doing that, the engineer who was doing this, Josh Wilson, was like, you know what? I think I can actually just write this thing in Node from scratch, and it would be faster. And it was three days to write a DHCP server from scratch in Node, um, which is an amazing testament to three things. Um, one, JavaScript. Um, I love JavaScript. I'm loud and proud about that. As a, a kernel C and assembly programmer, it took me many years to come to grips with my attraction to JavaScript. Uh, it, it felt like the forbidden fruit for a while, but I, now I'm loud and proud. I, I love JavaScript. Um, there are a lot of things I love about it. Um, it. In particular, JavaScript has got first class support for asynchrony thanks to closures. So you can, it's very easy to build an event-oriented asynchronous system in JavaScript. Um, but it, JavaScript's not enough. We needed V8. Huge debt of gratitude to V8, not just for V8, but for kicking off an arms race with all the other VMs. Uh, I, I, every time we have a high-performance JavaScript VM, we owe it to V8, because V8 is the one that actually kicked us off there. And that is critical. And then also, we've got what Node is, is basically those two things, JavaScript plus, plus V8, and then taking the Unix system abstractions, which are the system abstractions that God intended. Uh, I, I speak to God on a regular basis on these things, so I just want to, uh, he, he wanted me to convey clearly that, yes, this was my intent. It got confused there a little bit. Um, that's why he called Dennis home, I think, that he wanted to. Um, so the, the, the system abstractions that, that are actually the right system abstractions for Unix, you take that together, and that's what, that's what Node is. So Node for us has been terrific with the asterisk of how do you actually go debug these serious production problems, which the, like the problem that we had. Yeah, so um, before we get, we're, we're going to talk about our, our, you know, our approach to postmortem debugging for Node.js. Before we talk about it, we need to talk about this tool that we have on our systems called MDB. This is the modular debugger. Um, this is a debugger initially created as part of Solaris kernel development for postmortem analysis of kernel crash dumps. And what's really important about the kernel is that it's got a very large number of subsystems, each of which is pretty complex. And so, and they, of course, they interact with each other. So it's very important to be able to build tools to iterate sort of the, the objects of a particular subsystem and you know, figure out what the connections between these things are. So MDB really focuses on the ability to build tooling and build tooling on top of the other tooling. And the way you interact with it, we'll be demoing in a second, is you, you've got this thing that looks like a shell, and you're, um, you, know, you can pipe commands together. So you can walk the, some set of objects, and you pipe that to some other uh, D command that uh, you know, prints out information about those. And then you pipe that to something else. Um, that this is extremely important, and, and again, the ability to layer these things. So um, Brian's going to demo on the live, uh, the live kernel. So the MDB, of course, can also operate on the kernel that's running on the system. Um, what he's demoing now is a command called stacks. And what stacks does is it goes through all of the threads on the system, um, grabs a stack trace, and then uh, coalesces those. So it counts how many have the same stack, and it gives you a representative pointer for each one which is a pretty simple idea, but it's incredibly important to be able to do this on a system with thousands of threads. And you can filter that by uh, kernel module, by uh, function, or whatever you want. Um, now he's going to walk proc. So colon, colon, walk proc. So the, the syntax for MDB is definitely a, a little bit strange. Just sort of put that aside for a second. So walk proc is just going to iterate over all of the proc t structures in the kernel. And now he's piped that to, is that PS? Yeah, colon, colon, PS. You can pipe that to print proc t p user ucom. And now you're getting that field from all the proc structures. So it's, just, it's really important to be able to just quickly iterate through the state of the system. And um, it made a natural platform for building postmortem debugging for Node because it's already designed with the idea of building new tools into it and, and being able to put these things together. Uh, 
So with that, should we should we dive uh, right into the the core file that we yeah, have? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's, so let's. we we talked about the problem where we had uh, this node program um, spinning on CPU that w we didn't mention. We, we did check a lot of things. We checked like logs. We checked what system calls it was doing, right? Because a program has a hard time doing a lot of interesting things without making any system calls. You're not talking over the network. You're not writing files. It's like you're not outputting anything. Um, so it's just running on CPU. We took the core file in hopes that. Some day later, we would be able to figure out what it was. Now, Brian's opened up this, this core file. This is the core file we had from production the very first time that we saw this problem that we literally could not analyze for something like eight months. Yeah, although, Dave, just to correct you on one thing, you said that we took the core file in the hope that we would be able to debug it. That's actually, it's, it's actually a misread of history because we had no hope that we were ever going to debug it. And we took the core file because disk space isn't expensive and you That's might as true. well have the information. Um, but Dave in particular was like, man, we've got to go do postmortem debugging for Node. And I knew how complicated this was and how brutal the VM state would be, even for a, a, a much easier VM, a much lower performing VM. It's like, that's impossible. That's actually impossible. Um, I mean, yes, it's all software, blah, blah, blah. But this is, I mean, truly some software is impossible. And this was definitely in the impossible bucket for me. Um, but I don't know, have people read The Soul of a New Machine, by the way? Tracy Kidder's Soul of a New Machine. Um, excellent, excellent book. Um, and I, I would say a must read for every software engineer is The Soul of a New Machine. And it's a must read because it has all sorts of nuggets of wisdom. And one of the nuggets of wisdom pertains directly to this, that they brought in a junior engineer and nobody wanted to actually deal with this guy. Um, like everyone's busy, not because he was a jerk, but because everyone is busy. This is in Data General, 1979. They're all busy on this next computer and they just can't afford to mentor this guy. So they just kind of go tell him to go solve a problem. They tell him to go write a simulator for the new microprocessor because they know it's impossible to write a simulator and it'll keep him busy and he'll learn a lot and then you'll come back and you'll be frustrated and you'll figure out uh, how, to, how they can help out. He comes back two months later and says, okay, I'm done. They're like, done with what? Well, I'm done with the simulator. You told me to go write the simulator. I'm done with the simulator. And there's this great moment where the engineers look at one another and they realize that each had forgotten to tell him that it was actually impossible. He did it because he didn't know it was impossible. And I didn't want to like tell Dave that this was impossible, even though I firmly believed that it was. So I would kind of, oh yeah, sure, yeah, maybe Dave. And as Dave got excited about this, I'm like, oh yeah, it won't be that bad. Dave was like, you know, I don't think it's going to be that bad. And I'm like, Dave, it won't be that bad. And, no, of course not. Go, 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 go. It won't be that bad. It won't be that bad. And of course, like three weeks later, he's like, oh my God, this is awful. It's like, Dave, you, you, come on, you're, you're, you're three weeks in. Now you got to keep going. Um, so Dave did an incredibly difficult thing here. Um, and what, we're able, what I'm doing now is I'm loading the, the, the v8.so module. And you so know this was a long time ago because it's, it's pointing out that this was node v04. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know this actually is an actual dump for a long time ago. This is, I know, I'm sure Casper and folks must have a seizure when they see uh, 3.1.8.26. Um, but th yes, this is an old version of v8. Um, so we, we, th that's the stack trace. Um, actually, much more interesting is the JavaScript stack trace. So what we have here, what we're looking at, is the same stack trace we had before with just a bunch of hex addresses. But now for each one of them, it's annotated with information about what the JavaScript level frame is. So for the JavaScript frames, we actually have the name of the function, um, the file where it was defined, the line number where it was defined, if that's been computed, but at least the position information. And then we have some of the V8 internal frames and stuff like that. Um, run out with minus V. With, if I run out with the minus V option, um, this it, uh, like an apparition from the future tells me all where exactly I am for every frame of, of the stack. Um, I mean, this is much better than the number of, of vowels or whatever in the file name. This is everything. And even better, we actually have the arguments. And unbelievably, we can actually decode these, these arguments as JavaScript objects. I don't want to print that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's try that. Um, actually, e the computer is actually even very excited about this. It's like, <laughs> wow, did I just see what I thought? I Do you want to print this out? This is amazing. <laughs> I got to tell someone. I, I got to go tell someone about this. I'm just going to go print this out. You keep demoing. I know you're on stage, but wow, that's amazing. Um, and it is amazing. And in particular, this was going to allow us, and now as, as we had all of a sudden this unbelievable information, this was going to allow us to, to resolve another discussion we had, which is, Whose bug is this anyway? Because Dave and I, are both being gentlemen, um, so we, uh, this code, I've written some code in the system, Dave's written a bunch of code in the system, both being gentlemen, we each insist that it is a bug in our own code. Of course, we also honestly secretly believe and hope actually that it's a bug in the other guy's code. 
You actually don't want it to be a bug in your code. Oh, oh, I'm sure it's a bug in my code. Oh, no, 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 I'm sure it's a bug in my code. Please don't let it be my code. Please do not <laughs> let it be my code. Um, so this was, and, and unfortunately, this actually did not necessarily settle things when you look at the stack trace, because this is actually code that I wrote, and this is code that Dave wrote. So um, this could go anyway still. Um, so let's use the unbelievable JS print on what I've done is I've taken um, one of these arguments, the, the JS object argument there, and I'm going to actually print that out. That is the JSON that we actually, that, that comes from the program. This is meaningful in JavaScript. We've gone all the way up from the sewer to what we had for dinner. <laughs> if that smells like a stinky task, it is. Um, and I don't know if you can see any, I mean, obviously you guys don't know anything about this code necessarily, but do you see anything there that, that looks suspicious that you might correlate with an infinite loop? Min and max are the same. Yeah. Now, all right, now is, now is the argument. Like, so, okay, my code definitely was not checking for min and max being the same. So, okay, the infinite loop is in my code. Um, but Dave, as actually, w this code should never be called with min and max being the same. Now, both right. being gentlemen, we each insist that it is a bug in our code. It is a bug in my code. That's right. It's a bug in my code. But I'm, yeah, go fix your bug. I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I am going to fix my bug. We're both going to, I think we, we both agreed to fix both of our bugs. That's right. Um, and so the other key about this was the function that is at the top of the stack is completely stateless. Which, and we have both of the arguments, which means we actually got a reproducible test case just from the core file. So even if you know, it wasn't totally obvious that min equals max is going to cause this thing to go nuts, we could very easily test it at that point, which was huge. So it, we've got a bunch of other stuff here as well. Um, Colquhoun V8 function. Actually, is there an easy way I can get a V8 function on this? Let's see yeah, if we've got yeah, let's, uh, there we are. There, there we got one. Um, so that will actually um, print out a, a function. And I should be able to do minus D to that, right, Dave? Yeah. Um, so this actually, and th this matters to probably slightly fewer of you, but if you work on V8, um, th this is stuff that you're familiar with because this is actually taking us from the, the, the actual object that is the, the, the JS function down to the actual generated assembly and then disassembling it. Oh, my God. It's oh. going to go on for a long, Holy long time. smokers. You, you actually want to hit Q because it will take five minutes. Man, we do a lot of work. Wow. Thank God computers are fast. Um, so anyway, they, they, it allows you to, to, to get a level of introspection that we've never really had before. Um, and so Dave had, had delivered this to us like, like Prometheus. Um, and we were trying to, to, to think, you know, what are some of the other things we can go use this for? Actually, no, that's not even the way we were thinking about it. What we were thinking of is we have an excruciating problem that we don't know how to debug. Right. We Another have a one. different excruciating problem. We have a problem different excruciating problem. That we also had no idea how to figure out. Right. And that is memory use. So if you've deployed node productions in, pro in, in, in programs in production, or frankly, any dynamic language in production, you've been burned by memory utilization at some point. Right? And people love to, oh, I blame the GC. Oh, it's the GC. Um, it's virtually never the GC, especially with V8, terrific GC. Um, even if the GC is running really hard, it's probably not the GC. The problem is you're not generating any garbage. It's looking everywhere for garbage. You, but you have references to objects that, as far as V8 is concerned, as, part, as far as the VM is concerned, Java, whatever else, the objects are still live. It, it's not actual garbage. The, the garbage man does not come by your house, break into your house, and steal your sofa and throw it out. That's considered to be ungentlemanly. We don't do that. So it's not garbage. Now, you may think it's garbage, but it's not. So how do you actually, and the, the problem in V8, this, or in, in Node, this is a especially acute problem, event-oriented system. And the difference between your ability to do work and the incoming work that you have to do will be memory. So if you just can't keep up, your memory will begin to grow. And you need to know desperately, is my memory growth because I can't keep up? Or is my memory growth because I actually have a leak here? I've got something that is semantically leaked that I'm not actually freeing. And we wanted to go like walk the, the and Dave, because you were thinking about how, how to do this with, with V8, right? And how we could actually go walk the, the heap. I spent a lot of time thinking, well, you know, this, this debugger module, as we'll talk about, has a lot of knowledge about how V8 structures things. Like, but boy, it would be a whole nother level of complexity if it, knew, if it had to figure out how to iterate the heap properly, you know? Starting from GC roots, following all the objects that are referenced, and, and you know, following that along. And, and this is, you know, how young we, we become, you know, cynical veterans. So this, this problem today was already like, oh, my God, this is awful. Um, and then but I, I was in, in this code, and, and it, it, we're helping Xenos and so on, and I noticed it's like, actually, in order for something to be a V8 object, 
a lot of things have to be self-consistent. Things point to things that need to point back to other things that need to be of particular types and so on. So if you just look at an arbitrary bit of memory in, in your process, you can actually reason with a very high degree of certainty about whether it can't be a, a, a JavaScript object. So the question we had is, like, what if we just go through memory and try to treat everything as an object? Uh, it's like, wow, that is so filthy. Well, it's a great uh, example of the kind of brute force that you can do if you have the luxury of operating on a core file you know, out, outside the critical path of restoring service. Right? And I, I have to say, I love brute force on a core dump. It, it feels like, like the computer is doing work for a change. You know, it's like you go out, you, the, the human, its overlord, go out for a cup of coffee. Well, the, well, the computer, your servant, does all of this work. Through. So I love it when we go compute bound on a core dump. Um, and I don't know how long we're going to go compute bound here. So there we are. I, I just ran it. Colon, colon, find JS objects. Um, and actually, you know what? Let me, uh, I'll, I'll run that again, but with the, the minus V option, which is going to give us um, lots of um, find JS objects minus V, which will give us actually more information about the, um, the amount of time, one second. Um, the number of objects, um, the, the, and this is the number of reads of types that it did, the number of JavaScript objects it found, um, and process objects, and then unique objects. It uniquifies the objects by their actual properties. Um, and now there's, there's definitely some improvement we need to make here. You can see that we're identifying things that look a bit odd, but we're also finding a bunch of legitimate stuff here as well. Um, so let's just take kind of one of these randomly, and now I can JS print one of these guys. And you can see, I mean, this is, actually, this is obviously a legitimate JavaScript object. And we've been using this so much that the, I know that, that it, um, people have been complaining more and more about the performance of fine JS objects. Me? Dave. <coughs> Dave. This, right well, here. wait a minute. This one took one second. But when you actually have, I mean, this is a 27 meg core file. When you actually have a memory problem, and this core file is actually several hundred megs, it took a little bit longer. Yeah, it took a little bit longer. Like, it took like a minute it or like minute. two minutes. <laughs> And That's I'm true. sorry that Prometheus is held up in traffic, <laughs> OK? That's you fair. just have to be a little bit patient. I'm on my frigging way. With the fire. Uh, the, the, with, with fire, exactly. <laughs> but the, um, it, because the reason that Dave was complaining about it, actually, is because we've incorporated it into the way we develop node programs. And whenever anything goes wrong now with the program, the first thing we do is gcore it, um, let it run, just gcore it, take the core dump, and do a fine JS objects. And you like to do minus P, right, Dave? Yeah. Um, so let's see, I should be able to do like minus p exports. So that finds every JavaScript object that has an exports property. Oops, darn it, sorry, didn't mean to. Um, and then what I can do is actually go pipe that through, and we can actually look at all of those objects. So let's run that again. And sorry to quit there. Um, so if I do find JS objects minus p exports, was that uh, exports, sorry? I can pipe that through to find JS objects. That gives me, those are giving me the reference objects. Those are all the objects that match it. And then I, if I want, I can pipe that through to JS print. And these are the, those are the two kinds of objects that have exports members. This is useful, as it turns out. Um, and we use this a lot in developing our own node programs um, to the point that now we're complaining about the performance, which is good. That's, a, that's actually a great position to be in. Um, so, uh, and we've actually, I think most importantly, um, we've actually used this to debug real honest-to-God problems. So we had a, a really nasty um, uh, problem where we were consuming way too much heap. Um, that, and we were able to use fine JS objects. And Isaac, was, uh, Isaac Schluter, who works for Joint, um, was able to actually use it to, to actually confirm the hypothesis that he already had. So tremendously useful stuff. And Dave, I don't know if you maybe briefly want to touch on what's going on here. But yeah, so you know, we basically we spent a while talking about how hard this was, and then we just kind of showed it. It's like, well, this is kind of magic. How does it actually work? Well, obviously, at some level, our debugger module just knows a bunch of stuff about V8. It knows uh, how to walk object properties for a given object. It knows how to walk stack frames. And it knows how to decode uh, heap objects. But it was really important to us that it not be so brittle that any time V8 changes at all, that the thing just totally breaks. And so what we did is, I think you can actually go to the next slide. Um, we, we encode it in libv8, and then we propagate that into node. We encode a bunch of, I mean, this is really pretty half-baked. We basically just encode a bunch of offsets describing the structure of these heap objects and other useful constants, like you know, the, the JS function argument being used in each frame is always stored at you know, offset two words from the frame pointer. Like, that was just something we wanted to be able to parameterize by so that if we were doing this on a different architecture, or 3264 or whatever, it would still work. Um, and this, this was very useful. It means that when small changes are made, um, we don't just totally break all the time. But it continues to be a thorn in our side that 
if, if bigger changes are made to V8, you know, if, if those algorithms that I described change about how you walk properties of objects, that breaks our debugger module at the moment because the, the module is built separately from Node itself. And um, this is a kind of what we see as one of the bigger open problems in the future is how can we embed this knowledge in the VM? How can we encode in the VM enough information about uh, how to debug itself that doesn't rely on the VM still being running? And we've taken a baby step for that. I mean, and Slava and the V8 team have been terrific on helping us find ways to, to better encode that information from V8 to break us slightly less frequently. Mm -hmm. um, but we still get broken. Yes. <laughs> um, and cause it, it, and it, it's, it's hard. The logic exists in two places. Um, so it, there are actual problems with this approach. It's not completely perfect. Um, it, it, we think it's a great approach. It's comprehensive. It's got zero overhead. Um, but you do have the, the, this problem that it's brittle. Um, and we, we, we want to work on, on making it less brittle. Um, we've got some ideas to actually go do that. The key is that when, we're, when we have the technology to do this, it must not rely on the VM running. So that's, the, I think, the difference between this and most other debugging technologies that have come before it for dynamic, uh, and, dynamic environments. And the nice thing about that, too, is that as soon as we built this tool, immediately all of our node in production became debuggable in this way. We didn't have to go modify the application to do that, which I think is also pretty significant. So, th so that's MDB and postmortem debugging. Um, I want we, we, um, we don't have a huge amount of time left, but in the time we do have left, um, we want to talk about a, a kind of another axis of debugging, um, and that's debugging uh, transient problems, problems that are non-fatal, problems for which a a snapshot of state is insufficient to debug the problem. Now, a snapshot of state can be sufficient for lots of different kinds of problems. Um, but performance in particular can be very difficult to debug from a series of core dumps. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to do this in kernel development. Uh, in, the, in the kernel, we used to, in, in the kernel, we don't have a G-core equivalent. I mean, you actually, to take a core dump, you have to actually bring the system down. And the tooling was so bad historically that this, if a system were performing badly, we would want to actually go NMI the system or, or actually get a, a core dump, a crash dump on the system and reboot the system, which is like saying, oh, you, do you have a cold? OK, I'm going to shoot you in the brain, um, and then we'll know exactly where your cold came from. It's like, but I will be dead. It's like, well, yes, you will be dead, but we'll know exactly what happened to you. It's like, OK, what, who are you? This is, this, is, this is like a sadist you're talking to. Um, and yes, it's true that kernel developers also are all sadists at some level. But so we had this problem of how do we actually go um, instrument the, the, the kernel, debug the kernel, um, and in particular, how do we understand why the system is sucking? Um, and, th and we had this problem, again, uh, a decade and a half ago. And I, along with Adam Leventhal and Mike Shapiro at, at Sun, um, developed this technology called Dtrace. So uh, Dtrace allows us to dynamically instrument the production system. It, its design center is around production systems. Uh, how many people have uh, used Dtrace? Oh, OK, that's pretty good, actually. That's good. Um, so folks have used Dtrace. Those of you who haven't, um, this is a facility that, that we first shipped um, in 2000. Uh, it was 2003 that we first shipped it. Uh, it was open source in 2005. Um, it's now in all Illumos derived systems, like SmartOS, which is from Joyent, OmniOS, um, all Solaris derived systems. It's in BSD. Um, it's in FreeBSD. And it's on your Mac. Um, Linux ports are in progress. So that's finally happening after many years of excuses for why that couldn't happen. Um, but th that's now moving forward as well. So um, it, it, it is a, a technology that is, it is slowly becoming ubiquitous, certainly on Mac, FreeBSD, um, and, and Illumos drive systems. So dynamic environments pose the same kind of problem for Dtrace that MDB posed and, and postmodern debugging, which is to say, now I want to instrument the system, and I want to understand what's going on at the highest la layers of software. When we first developed Dtrace, and I'll, when I first did this, I embarrassingly was only thinking about the kernel. I mean, who cares about applications? Applications just exist to put load on the beautiful operating system. Um, but as we actually went in and we went kind of fourth in the world with Dtrace, we discovered that the much larger performance wins to be had were not from making the kernel incrementally better on these pathological loads, but understanding where the pathology was actually coming from up stack. And C and C++ environments can do a certain amount of damage, but oh my gosh, the dynamic environments can do a lot more damage. Um, you've got a Perl script. I can't tell you the number of Perl scripts written to monitor the system did themselves become the problem with the system. 
Um, when you go up on DTrace, you're like, what's this Perl script? Oh, that's the Perl script we have to monitor the system. Yeah, it's killing the system, actually. Um, very fine line between the policing mind and the criminal mind when it comes to monitoring software. Um, so uh, we needed to get up into these dynamic environments to understand what was going on. But now we're from, we're from the kernel. We're looking up from the, 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 the lowest layers of the software up into this VM that we can see nothing into. How do we actually go do this? Well, one of the things that we added were something called statically defined uh, tracing. And you could have these things called USCT providers where you instrumented the VM itself and said, here's where I'm making a function call. Here's where I'm doing this. Here's where I'm doing that. Um, and some uh, Ruby, Python, PHP, Erlang took that approach. It works for some. Bluntly, it does not work for higher performing VMs. For lower performing VMs, this is easier. For higher performing VMs, it, it becomes excruciating to even have additional code bloat, even though they're NOPs, um, where you're actually doing the, the, these function calls. So we need to take a different approach, or, to, or we decided to take a different tack for Node. Um, the, the first thing that we did uh, is we added USDT probes in Node itself. Um, and this allowed us to get, for example, probes are when we're doing a GC, um, which is useful, right? I mean, if I, uh, I think, yeah, the example on the next slide of using uh, Node, uh, of instrumenting GC start and GC done. Um, and actually, I'll just hop onto the, the box here and show you what this looks like. Um, so let's go back over here. And we're on a box that's got, um, that's running lots of Node all the time. Um, I'll go on here. And I'm just going to instrument um, GC start and GC done. So if I do Node, node star GC start, I'm going to see output whenever any node process starts doing GC. And fortunately, we have enough node processes doing enough non-trivial work, on, uh, even on this VM, that someone just did GC. Um, now, you may want to know who actually did GC. So you could say printf uh, percent %d percent %s started a GC, dot, dot, dot. And we'll make that a PID. And cur ps info points to PR ps args. My, and make that quiet. So now, um, when, of course, now I'm sure it won't oblige me. I'm sure now no one will do a GC. But the next time someone does a GC, there we go. We see that th th that node process, the workflow runner.js, just started a GC. Then you can look at things. You can instrument GC start, GC done, measure the latency across it, and so on. Um, so there we go. Now we got, oh, hey, everyone does a GC. OK, party on my laptop. Um, so, and, and we, we can get these, these kind of histograms. The, we are strong believers in ASCII art. Um, you can get the, these uh, the great histograms to actually understand where this, this latency is actually coming from. Um, and actually, Dave, you got a good little, uh, there's actually a good little program that Dave wrote. Um, where is it? Uh, it's uh, it's NHTP. Snoop, right? Yeah, so this yeah. is a little goober that Dave wrote. This is just a shell script. And what this is a shell script around all of these node probes. So I think I could just run this and without any options, right, Dave? Yeah, that'll show you HTTP activity. That's, that's what I originally built it for. So anytime a, a node process does an HTTP request or serves up HTTP, I think as well. Oh, there we go. OK. So the, the, the workflow again, which is kind of the, this little goober we have that's doing work on this, just did a put, a get, a get. You can see the actual latency. And the, the kind of the cool thing here is, and this is on GitHub, by the way, if you look for n HTTP snoop, uh, I think it's minus n, right, Dave? Yeah, there we are. That actually prints out the Descript that it actually generated, filthy in some cases. Uh, boy, that's. Um, it's a complicated Descript. But so th this, is a, this is just a, a, a Descript, the Descript script, that um, instruments server request, server response, measures the latency, um, prints it out in, in kind of a, in a pretty format, and so on. Um, so and this, was, this has been good. Um, and we've, we've used this. Um, it, this has been very helpful. Um, we've used this to debug real problems, to, to really understand nodes latency, GC latency, and so on. Uh, actually, it was great to share some of that production data with the V8 guys initially, because the numbers we thought looked great. And the V8 guys were like, wow, that's, that's really nice. <laughs> that GC, it actually like, is actually doing GC for very short periods of time. Like, yes, yes, you did a very good job. Um, so it was great to actually see the data from production systems that, that it could feed back to them. And, and that case, there wasn't an issue, so it was great. Um, we wanted to allow people to, th those are adding probes effectively in C++ in Node, because that's what's bound to V8. We wanted to allow people to add probes in JavaScript itself. Chris Andrews did terrific work on the Node Dtrace provider. This module allows you to define your own probes in JavaScript. Uh, and then fire them selectively. Uh, and this has been huge for us. Uh, our colleague, Mark Cavage, has used this extensively for his uh, he did, did, uh, node, uh, node Restify and LDAP.js. LDAP.js, a from scratch implementation of ASN.1 parsing to implement an LDAP server in Node. No, this was not a punishment. Uh, this was actually elective. Um, and yes, it was done for good reasons. It's been terrific. Um, but so th th we've been using this a lot. It's allowed us to measure the latency in these systems. 
one of the keys when you're looking at D-trays is correlating system activity deep in the system to what's going on way up the stack. And you know, again, we have that same problem that we had when we were talking about post-mortem debugging, where if you go to do this, you actually have a hard time seeing what's going on. So I, in particular, I've got my, uh, I think I've got a little script here, I think Mr. Spinney. Um, dot js. So I'm gonna, if I run Mr. Spinney dot js, um, Mr. Spinney is just going to go spin around. Um, and uh, let me log into that box. Um, and what we're going to do is I want to understand what's going on there. I, I, could, I could see, for example, that if I run PR stat, I can see that, OK, he's spinning on CPU. I want to understand what he's doing. So maybe I want to, um, let's actually run a, a profile probe. And historically, what you do is run a profile probe and say exec name equals node, let's say. Um, let's um, just get aggregate on a, on a user stack backtrace. If I run that and control C it, I am, I'm into this old problem again. Remember this? this is a, so we're seeing, again, stack frames that in hex. We've had this problem historically in dtrace. And we knew we had this many years ago with Java and the JVM. And so we're trying to figure out how to solve this with JVM. And if anything, it was actually even harder to solve it in Dtrace than it was in MDB, because we didn't have the luxury of being post-mortem. We're in situ, which is to say we're executing in the kernel. So in the kernel, this thing has done a, you know, let's say it's done an open system call or what have you, or it's being taken off CPU. We need to, at that moment, go walk up its stack and, and correlate these hex addresses to actual proper frames. That is brutal to do um, in situ. And so we couldn't find a better way to do this. We invented this crazy ass mechanism called Ustack helpers that allow you to write this very weird piece of software that we compile and glom onto the executable. When the executable runs, that gets ioctal downstairs into the kernel. And that software, which is written in a Turing incomplete language, D, allows us to, in a totally safe manner, actually translate in situ stack frames to JavaScript frames. Now, that's a lot of like talking. Um, so let's actually just see it in action. If, if from your perspective, if someone's developing software, I want to understand, and I'll you know, add a another option there to allocate plenty of, of stack size for it. I misspelled stir size. Um, so now if I run a J stack, the J actually is not for JavaScript, it's for Java, um, because that's what we originally developed it for. I can now see where I am. Mumble calling froths and so on. I know exactly where I am. We can take this data and then go visualize it in actually some really interesting ways. So one of the things that, that our colleague Brendan Gregg did um, is, and I'm all kind of, I'll we'll come back to that as needed, but so this is the profile provider. One thing our colleague Brendan Gregg did is took this and visualized it as a, this thing called a flame graph. And the, the flame graph allows us, and let me bring up the full version of that. Dave, maybe you want to explain this why. Uh... Yeah, so the idea is, okay, you're running this profile probe 100 times a second on, say, 32 CPUs for 60 seconds. You have an enormous number of stack traces, but how do you actually visualize them? Well, you figure most of them probably start with main at the bottom, right? And then they start diverging a little bit. Well, the, the node ones will all say node, start, EV run, UV run. And then they start diverging. And then there'll be a couple of common frames in this silo. And then it starts diverging again. And so the question is, well, how do you actually visualize it? This is what we did, what Brendan Gregg did, actually. Um, and so you have these silos that represent places where it diverged uh, relatively low in the stack. And you can zoom in on each of these things. So if you can, like, if you zoom into the corner, you can hover over each of these things. And at the top, it'll tell you which function that was and how much of the overall time was spent in that function. So for a CPU bound process, it's a process that's on CPU, like say 100% of the time, you can see exactly how much time was being spent in each JavaScript function. And it's actually a little better than that because you actually have JavaScript and C++ functions and anything else you're doing. So you know, if you're using libping as we are to generate other types of images, you see the libping frames too. You see the SSL in there as well. And so, I mean, if you look in here, so these are all, just as Dave was saying, these, you got some C++ frames in there, but then you've also got the JavaScript frames, and it allows you to actually debug where you are in your JavaScript and visualize it. Um, and, and importantly, for a production system, you know, we didn't restart the program. We didn't run it with any special flags that caused the VM performance to decrease. This was just the program was running at full speed in production. Right. This has, and this is the, 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 the most important axiom of Dtrace, other than safety. Safety in production and no probe effect when not enabled. The important thing is that you can take Dtrace, walk up to a system that is totally optimized, and without restarting anything, use Dtrace to answer questions about what it's doing. So this was a really key technology. 
Um, we got a bunch of other real world examples, and we'll obviously be putting our, our slides online, but we want to be obviously be mindful of time. Um, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, um, th this technique of post mortem debugging of, of Node in particular has been huge. Um, and I, if I could get in a time machine right now, I would go back just a year ago and tell us that we are going to go and we would be presenting this unbelievable work that we have done because I didn't think it was possible. I mean, I, I, it's amazing to me that we've been able to do this. Um, and it's been incredibly useful. We've already used it to nail these really nasty bugs. Yeah, problems that we literally could not debug before, like the infinite loop one that we described. Like, we had no idea how to debug that before. So this is not taking something that's hard and making it easier. This is taking something that's impossible and making it possible. And that, uh, that's been terrific for us. We're using it in our own, de our, our own development. Um, now that we've got kind of things working and we've working so well, um, there are some open problems still. We want to make it less brittle. We want to package it with the VM. There's a lot more we could go do. I think one of the questions that we, that Dave and I always have is, if you were designing a VM from, the, from ground zero, from day zero, and you were designing it for debuggability, what kinds of things could you design into it without sacrificing performance? Um, and frankly, there's not really a VMs that, that have been designed with that in mind, with production debuggability. Um, so it, it's really exciting that we've been able to get all this working with, with V8. Um, and I, I think that we've been a little bit surprised that the post-mortem approach has actually worked at all for heat profiling. Yeah. I don't think we really anticipated that. Um, it showed a lot of promise. That's a very hard problem. Um, what we have defined JS objects is kind of a lurch forward, but there's a lot more yeah. to, to be done there. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much, and we'd welcome your questions. I, I, sorry, I, from the core dump, can you unexec? Um, no. <laughs> is, is the short answer. Um, that, that unexec is a brutally hard problem that works under extremely isolated conditions. Um, and it works when, I mean, as soon as you have a connection open to another process, of which Node has many, you're, like, it's very hard to go and, and actually go rehydrate all of that, that dynamic state. So there has been work done to unexec. In fact, the, the V8, you guys use it. You can take a snapshot in part of the build process. You can do it when you know that that is a very kind of confined environment. I don't have external state. I don't have, I, I don't have connections. I can go do it there. In a, a process in production, you can, in this process, we could not have done it. Thank you very much. Thanks.